when you think WrestleMania in Roman Reigns, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Mm. Uh, I'm not really sure. Roman Reigns, WrestleMania. I guess you could say main eventer. He's gonna be main. He's gonna have the most WrestleMania main events of all time by the end of this year. So, I guess you. Could yeah, he has seven so event. far, going into eight, or actually eight and nine, <laughs> if you want to cut the two nights. So yeah, he would surpass be, Hogan. Yeah. So yeah. I guess you could say main eventer. Those are kayfabe backlades. You know, those are yeah, given, yeah. not really. You know, they are what they are, right? Do you? So do you think that ten out of forty? Your gut feeling before we kind of dive into this is kind of accurate due to the seven main events, and we only have three all-time matches here. Mind you, an all-time match is four stars and above from one of our rankers. So is 10 warranted off the bat before we get going? What do you think? I don't know if i put him in top 10. I mean, Undertaker, Shawn Michaels, The Rock. Those Heart, guys would, Savage, Stone Cold. Those guys would be in there. Well, Taker and Shawn for sure are one and two. Mm-hmm. The Rock has provided the biggest matches in WrestleMania history to me. Top especially five. now especially now with you know, coming back a part of this feud. Um Hogan top Edge. five still cold. Edge is around low tens, would, early ten it, eight nine. Would, let's see, I would probably put Edge up in there. TLC he has some good matches. Undertaker, WrestleMania main event underrated. He came back and had the match against Roman and, and Daniel. Edge could make a case to be in there. Triple H, I would put in the top 10 as well. He's had some really good classic WrestleMania moments. He's lingering. H Hogan. He's important, though. Hogan's importance, man. Yeah, but that's like kayfabe, too. That's like accolades, you know? I mean, how many good matches has he really had at WrestleMania? He's had a couple. I think uh, well, I think his, I think his match with Macho Man is really, really good. Uh, yep. His match is Warrior, I think, is it's a top five WrestleMania main event to me that I've seen. Mm -hmm. Uh, his match with The Rock, obviously iconic. I love the um, Vince match for what it is. The Vince match was pretty good for for what that was. Um, yep. So, Andre, of course, he, can't disrespect the man. I love Slaughter's well, undefeated. Slaughter is uh, that was all right. Uh, the Andre match wasn't that great, but it's it's iconic for important reasons, you know. Mm -hmm. So the uh, Sid the, match is whack. The uh, significance importance of that. So Hogan, I would probably say top ten, but I don't know about top five for me. Um, I don't know. Roman may he may have he may have the case to be a top ten. I mean, I think the main events really count. I mean, some of them were good, some of them weren't weren't as great. Um, yep. But I do think some of those that weren't that great weren't necessarily his fault either. So we can dive into that in a minute. Sure. Let's just start here. The, the Shield stuff. The Shield stuff is is what it is. Pretty much, it opens up WrestleMania twenty nine against Randy Orton, Sheamus, and the Big Show. And they go out and deliver a good WrestleMania opener. Personally, I go three stars. Good match. It's Meltzer, two and a half. Canton, two and a half. Chad, uh, three and a quarter. So overall, kind of the same sentiment there. And then the Outlaws, Meltzer, two. One from Canton. Chad, two and a half with Kane. It, it, that, I think that match got trimmed, but it wasn't going to be anything special anyway. So he's established early at WrestleMania within Shield, but his better Shield matches are outside of WrestleMania. Yep. But his first big spot is WrestleMania 31 main event against Brock Lesnar. Uh, and, and I guess Seth Rollins. But, man, this okay. is a classic. The Shield matches, I would I would rank the first one. I'd give that three stars. I thought it was pretty solid. The, yep. the second one was one star. I mean, that was a squash match pretty much. So uh, that WrestleMania should have been the Shield versus the Wyatts, I believe. Uh, if that had happened. Yeah, they did that a month earlier. Been, that would have been a, a, a huge classic. Uh, the match against Brock. So going into that WrestleMania, Roman really didn't feel like a fresh WrestleMania main event guy yet at that time. You know, at least to me, he didn't feel like he yep. was ready for that spot. You know, and going up against Brock, who was the most dominant guy in the company, you know, coming off end of the streak and then conquering Super Cena the year before. I don't yep. think a lot of people really believed or really could think Roman could beat Brock, but I don't think people really thought Brock was going to be champ after Mania either. So he really didn't know what scenarios were going to go down in this match. It was kind of very unpredictable as far as what direction they would go in, like what could really happen. It was it was very up in the air. Obviously, Seth cashing in was you know icing on the cake, as I would say, uh, adding you know one of the biggest moments ever. Um, yep. But the Brock and Roman match itself was was fantastic. I mean, that's Absolutely. that's still the best match they've had to me, um, just for the fact that Roman was still trying to prove himself. Brock was showing his dominance, and the story they were able to tell as far as 
swerving the fans, not really knowing which way they were going to go. I don't think a lot of people knew what, the, what that outcome of that match was going to be. I was for sure didn't. I didn't know who the hell was going to win that match. You know what I mean? I wasn't even <laughs> thinking about Seth Rollins because, you know, after he had lost to Randy earlier in that match, early in, yep. in that night, I wasn't thinking about him cashing in, but it was the perfect scenario for what needed to happen. But the match itself, very, very good. That's uh, that's a top 10 WrestleMania main event for sure. Underrated how brutal Brock Lesnar was on that match. That guy was at 10. Right off the bat, he just jumps Roman and he's throwing this guy around like he's yeah. Billy Kidman at a cruiserweight. I think, I, think, uh, I think Roman even said he busted up a couple of ribs in that match or something like that. You know what I mean? Like, Roman Reigns got his ass beat like many people did in that time frame by Lesnar. You know what I mean? But he had a really good comeback, though. Like, when he was coming back and Brock was oh, yeah. selling, he was bleeding. You were like, oh, shit. Like, mm -hmm. So, yeah, Roman was very sympathetic in that match. Like you said, no one really wanted him yet. They didn't. He wasn't yearning. He was kind of forced, but he did a good job of gaining sympathy within that match with the crescendo of Seth Rollins coming down. In hindsight, about 10 years later almost now, do you think it was the right call? You should they have made Roman with that sympathy card. You think he was good? No, no, Seth Cashin, and that's too iconic. Yeah, that was that was the right I, call. I I tend to agree, but some would make a case that a pinball effect coming out of that would hurt the next three or four WrestleMania is coming out of it. But I see well, that I case. I ain't, I ain't changing I, it. I don't think it would have mattered. I mean, whether Roman would have won or lost, it wouldn't have mattered. Like, they were going to push him no matter what, whether the fans liked him or booed him. If they yeah. were going to change plans, then he would have never made an event at all those WrestleManias. So none of that shit would have mattered. They were going to push him regardless of how the fans felt about him, whether he got cheered or booed. They made that clear throughout the years as he continued to – be in the main events of WrestleMania when people didn't want him there. So whether he had one or not, it wouldn't have mattered. They were going to put him in the main events no matter what. They already knew that they wanted him before the Shield even had split up. I tell you, go back and look at stuff like the yeah. little, the little stuff that they would tweak. You know, what I'm saying I'll break it down for you real quick before we dive into it because people don't pay attention to the small details sometimes. But if you go back and look at like 2013, that's when they really started to kind of position Roman in strong spots. Go back to 2013 Survivor Series when they had a traditional Survivor Series match. The Shield was involved. There were some other teams, but Roman Reigns was the sole survivor, but he eliminated four people in that match out of five. You know what I mean? So he dominated. When the Shield had the feud with CM Punk, CM Punk individually had matches with all three guys week by week on Raw, and the only guy to beat Roman in that group was... <laughs> the only guy to beat Punk was Roman Reigns in the group, but he beat everybody else in the Shield. Then you look at the Royal Rumble 2014. He broke the record of Kane eliminating those people had a dominant resume. Uh, even after the Shield broke up, they were still grooming him in small spots. You know, he was in main event spots like the Money in the Bank or when they fought for the WWE World Heavyweight Titles. He was in that match. Uh, he main evented Battleground with John Cena, Roman Reigns. John Cena, Kane, uh, and Randy Orton uh, and Roman Reigns was a fatal four main event. So Roman was kind of the odd guy out because he didn't have the accolades at the time as those three do. So they were kind of, and then they put him in SummerSlam against Randy Orton. Like they were grooming him for small spots to be ready. They were ready the only problem is that WWE was ready and the fans weren't ready for him. I mean, like the fans weren't ready to accept him, but the WWE was ready to to establish him. That was the only issue. That's why he got rejected all those years because he was forced in the fans. Obviously, once they knew he was the company guy, they obviously were going to to reject him. But they were going to push him no matter what. Once the once the Shield broke up, he's in the he's in the WrestleMania main event right there. He's already main event WrestleMania after the, uh, not even a year after the Shield broke up. So they uh, they were always going to to push him the way they wanted to the plan is the plan <laughs> yeah for certain people yeah certain people the plan they're not gonna especially when Vince run, running the show back then he wasn't gonna change his mind on roman reigns like that was his that was his next guy so he already made yeah, his mind. You, can, you can kind of look at that as a start of a little bit of a decline there but i think i think um out of all the people that you look at who've been the top guys I think Brock Lesnar and Roman Reigns were the two like golden childs that Vince had from the start because those guys were never in bad positions. You look at Hogan. Hogan was already Hulk Hogan before he came to WWE. You know what I mean? Like he was already mm -hmm. that. Brett and Sean had been built up to be in that spot. You know what I mean? But they were never like the first options. Even Rock and Austin. The Rock was Rocky Maivia. Stone Cold was the ringmaster when he came in. So those guys weren't even the first options. John Cena wasn't either. He was prototype. You know, prototype. tight John Cena. You know so. Brock Lesnar, Roman Reigns, those were the two like golden shots. Go back and look at the resume. Brock Lesnar comes to the main roster. He wins the title within like six months on the roster. He's instantly pushed in the main event spots. Roman Reigns, as soon as the shield splits up, instantly pushed in the main event spots. Those guys have never been in bad positions. WrestleMania 31 here. 
the plan was the plan, and they stuck with it. Meltzer, four and a half. Canton, only four. I'm going to have to have a conversation about that one. Chad, four and three quarters for a 4.42. Second, Roman Reigns, second best WrestleMania match of all time. Personally, this is a five for me. I think it's top 10, top 15 WrestleMania match of all time. I just I would give it. I don't, I, I don't see how some of these people rank some of these matches. I don't know what they're basing it off of. I'll get, it's a five to me. It's mm -hmm. one of the most entertaining, unpredictable, up-in-the-air main events that – didn't have a lot of high expectations that definitely over exceeded expectations and delivered with the great historic moment to end it off with the heist of the century that people still call the greatest catch in of all time. So mm -hmm. it had great moments and had unpredictability, it had everything you could ask for. It's a, it's a five star classic. It's a top 10 WrestleMania main event ever. Yep, for sure. Now, 32 Triple H is the opposite. Uh, it's it's long. I believe it just ended. Uh, it's it's 30, too much. 34 minutes. Wow. Jesus. That's crazy. That's absolutely insane. Meltzer, uh, in, an insane three and a quarter stars. Canton, two and a half. Chad, one and three quarter stars. I'm about two and a half stars. I watched it like during COVID. I'm like, it's an okay match. If you shave 10 minutes, it's better. It's it's just way too much. And I kind of blame that on Triple H. Like, what are we doing? You got to learn, read the crowd, get out there and do your thing. And you should have learned from Randy Orton, man. What, what are we doing? He's in Triple H's WrestleMania resume is lack lacking these long inducing matches and Roman Reigns became victim of it. Yeah, I don't think a lot of people even cared much about this match to begin with. Yeah. I mean, WrestleMania 32 did have some detriments because uh, we know Seth Rollins got injured, John Cena was not cleared, and Randy Orton was hurt too, so they were missing three of their big guys. But, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, Triple H and Roman, I mean, people just knew what the outcome was going to be, and I just don't think people just care too much about the feud in general. No. Um, I don't think the match was as bad as some people make it to be. It was just boring, what just because yeah. I think this. I just, I just think it was hard for people to really care enough about it. You know what I mean? So, I, I, I give it maybe like a solid three, if anything. Yeah. I think they, they tried to do. I think they tried the best they could to do with what they, what they were working with. Um, I just don't think the fans could really invest enough to really say, "Oh, this is exciting," or like they, you know, what I'm saying it was just. Everybody at the time, this is when the Roman hate really started to grow. Yes. And people knew Triple H was like a transitional champion. He wasn't going to be champion yeah. for long. So it was just a bad spot for both of them. Uh, they should have had this is the spot where they should have went out and had that Brock Goldberg five and a half minute sprint of from the 33. They should have done that here. It would have been received much, much better. But speaking of WrestleMania 33, the rain event versus The Undertaker, no holds barred. I was, this is my first this is the first wrestlemania i bought my boys to and uh oh you went there was, yeah i was at this one this one was long <laughs> it was a, oh, it yeah, wasn't my yeah, first wrestlemania but it was the first wrestlemania i brought my kids to and eli fell asleep twice and during the main event was this match <laughs> <laughs> during this, yeah, this, match this was one like, wrestlemania was god almost like seven hours right it was yeah this was a five-hour wrestlemania and, and this is their first mania they got to get there right away they were there for the austin theory fucking neville match that's how pumped they were so they were there for eight hours and uh Man, these guys going out there and having a 23-minute match, just a bad idea. Three stars from Meltzer, two stars from Canton, three stars from Chad. It's it's two, two and a quarter for me. I watched this recently for something else. It's just bad. The Undertaker is old. He's just yeah. a step behind Roman. Roman's actually not bad in it with his striking and all that stuff. It's, it's, not, it's not his fault. Some of these matches weren't his fault, like I said, so... Back to back years, it's not uh, his. Fault. I, I would give it about two and a half. Um, just Roman could only help out Undertaker so much. He could only do so much. Undertaker was old and beat up. If if you watch the Last Ride documentary, he even said himself that he had to have his hip replaced and he was out of shape and he shouldn't have been in the ring that year. Like, but he already had committed to it, so he wasn't going yep. to to back away from it. But he just he had nothing. He wasn't able physically to give Roman Reigns what he needed to be yep. able to contribute to the match to make it something so now quick quick sidebar i don't want to go too far here they do the trap something like the tribal chief the next night where roman stands in the ring and he has that awesome reaction that great moment could they have gone and done something like that then yes bro that was the night to turn him heel right there that was, that, the was, that was the perfect night that's one of the most nuclear crowds i was at that heard. one it was very cool it was subdue it was weird the aura was weird but it kept building and building and building and i was Bro, like wow this is a fucking moment before so you were in the crowd i was watching at home but yep. they let 
you know, the crowd chant Undertaker for a minute, then it switched from Undertaker to Roman Sucks. They let the crowd chant for at least five, seven minutes, you know what I'm saying, before Roman's yep. music hit. And then he hit, his music hits, the fucking place just goes insane. Awesome. And then he stands in the ring, just having the crowd right in the palm of his hand. Every time he put the mic up to his face, they would react. They're chanting all these things, and then he drops. This is my yard now. Drops the mic. That was it, one of the coldest things I've ever it seen. It was the time. Yeah, it was time, was but... Ah. Whatever. They, I'm not, they, we're not they executed that so perfectly. Yeah, they executed yeah. that so perfectly. And that non-execution of Fallout really lingered 34. No one wanted this at 34. No one wanted a Universal Championship match to be Brock Lesnar versus Roman Reigns. 15 minutes, 55 seconds. Meltzer, three stars. Canton, two stars. Chad, three to quarter. For a 2.75 average. Three stars? Oh, this way too much. No, this this is a one. This is this is the worst WrestleMania man I've ever seen, bro. I hate this match so much. <laughs> I can't stand this match. Not even I don't even dislike either yeah. guy, but yeah. you have the two guys in the main event that you know the fans number one don't want in the main event spot, and number Not two don't want to fight for the championship. But what made it even worse? You go into the match. I think everybody's pretty much expecting Roman's going to win. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think too many people thought he was going to lose. But this dude took six F5s to get beat at WrestleMania. One not even, table. Not even the six F5s, but he took five in a row. Like, it wasn't even like an F5. They fight. He took three in a row, and then he took one through the announce table and then got thrown back in the ring, took another one, and still kicked out. I'm like, this is fucking crazy, man. Like, this is, there's no way. And it's crazy because the reason it's so bad, well, they had to stretch out the Brock and Roman feud even longer that year, which nobody wanted, but. Three more matches. The reason it sucked so bad was because you had Brock beat Roman with six F5s. It didn't even take that many F5s for Brock to conquer the streak or to conquer John Cena or to even beat, like, a Samoa Joe or a Braun Strowman, like, some of those guys even got beat with just one F5, and it took six to beat Roman at WrestleMania. It didn't even take six to beat The Undertaker at WrestleMania. It took three extra F5s to beat Roman Reigns than what it took to, to conquer the streak at WrestleMania. So that basically you're telling us that Roman Reigns is stronger than all those guys, character-wise, which is not true. So this is why a testament to why a lot of people hated Roman around this time, too. I don't think it was necessarily Roman himself. It was just the booking they had around him. They're trying to... They're trying too hard to make him this over-the-top babyface that people don't want him as, and they're trying too hard to push him as this, this dominant force when his character never screamed that to begin with, like it does now. So mm-hmm. it was just it was just all all around just terrible booking. The fact that this was the main event of WrestleMania was already doomed from the beginning. I already knew that it was gonna shit the bed, and the fact that this man literally took five F fives in a row and kicked out, I can I honestly couldn't believe myself. I was like, there's no way that they they they're, 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 they're doing this. And even after this man was bleeding in the ring, the fans still didn't care. And they don't even do blood in WWE anymore. So it was like... It's two Roman yeah. matches they've done blood for Brock Roman. Yep. Yeah. And I, 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 was, I was at this one too. Eli didn't fall asleep during this match. But the girl next to me in a Roman vest was bawling her eyes out when Roman lost. I was like, damn. <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, Roman obviously had his supporters and everything. He'll always have his supporters, but it's like... They they oh my they were they were trying too much, bro. Like you can't this have, is uh you can't have Roman and Brock in the main event in twenty eighteen, bro, and expect people to to fully invest into it. No. With the six F fives, that's a hundred percent Paul Heyman, like do this this will work. That this is the only negative part of Paul Heyman, the over emphasis of a point. Like they were trying to make sure Roman Reigns looked strong in defeat, and it wasn't necessary. Three of them would have been just fine with the table spot. But to do six of them and then he kicks out out of five of them, yeah. like that's I agree, it's too much. But I did think the ending was pretty decent. I went two and a half. I thought it was fine. I understand the match rejected it, but eliminate half those F5s and it has some of the intensity 31 has, but it's just not there. The, the no, feud wasn't is, ready this, for it. The fans didn't want it, and it was a hundred percent rejection. This is uh this is the top five worst WrestleMania I've ever seen. It's a one for me. I can't I can't say nothing nice about this match for me. I hated it so I feel much. You. I feel you. But 35 is a tough spot against Drew. Uh, I'm in remission, y'all. Great moment. Comes back. He's good. 
But oh God, this was the longest WrestleMania ever. Jesus. And this is right in the middle. And unfortunately, again, I was there, and this is where I went and got the snack with Eli. <laughs> it was Damn, during this went match. To three, three straight manias. Ooh, good look. You went to the with the kid with the kids, man. Like to the long what am I doing? ones, man. You went to the long ones, man. Jesus. Yeah, I know. It's crazy. I wasn't there though. We got we got one more to go attend. But um Roman's music hit. Drew actually Drew's entrance was awesome with the kilts and the bad pipes and all that stuff. That was sick. Roman's yeah. music hit. Eli's goes, All right, let's go now. Eli's my littlest son. I'm like, damn. That just kind of proves how Roman Reigns, I'm in remission, the cancer, the acceptance, Damn. so on and so forth. They still ain't having it. There was a, you could hear a pin drop during this uh, 10 minute match. Yeah, nobody really reacted to it. I'd give it about a two. I mean, so, it, at least he wasn't in the main event, I guess you could say. He didn't main yeah. event that year. So, um, this triumph is returned. Should have been it, but it wasn't. This, 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 and you know what? Drew and Roman have really good matches too. So this is great chemistry. Worst, this is probably the yeah. worst match they've had because um, they've had they had a great match at Survivor Series during the pandemic. The match they had at Clash of the Castle, but sensational. Like they've awesome. had some, they have had some really good matches. So I think it was just the crowd, not really, not really, probably a little bit tired too, because this was there in the middle of WrestleMania 35. So. They probably mm-hmm. were already kind of a little drained out. WrestleMania was right very after the long. Cena Thugonomics, I think, yeah. right after that. So yeah, the, the match was very long, and you know, I mean, not the match, but like the show was just very long, and you know, it's just, yep. I give it about a two. Yeah, same. But it's it's whatever. So Triple H crowd n- not having it way too long. Brock Lesnar crowd not having it at all. Undertaker way too long crowd not having it. Drew McIntyre crowd ain't having it. So, is that on Roman Reigns as we move past this section of his WrestleMania resume? Is that on Roman Reigns? A mixture of the booking? What's your overall sentiment before we jump out of the Big Dog era into the Tribe era? I think I think it, it goes into the booking. I mean, the Triple H match. I, I if if Seth Rollins never got hurt, I I fully hundred percent believe the Shield would have made a event at WrestleMania that year. I think it would have been the Shield triple threat in the main event. Granted, yeah, thirty two. Yeah, excuse me, granted. Um, Roman probably still would have won, you know what I mean? But that would have been a more of a hyped match that fans could have really cared about, and it would have been, I think, a really good match. Uh, the match against Undertaker, definitely not on him because Undertaker just wasn't in physical shape to even compete inside the ring. It didn't matter if it was Roman Reigns. He could have been in the ring with Seth Rollins and AJ Styles. He could have been in the ring with some of the best. And <laughs> yeah. Undertaker o- still... Only a Boneyard is saving him then. <laughs> yeah, he wouldn't have been able to to do too much. Uh, the Brock Lesnar one definitely goes to booking. The fact that they structured these two guys to be in the main event when you know the fans don't want them in the main event, it was doomed from the beginning. So there wasn't. I don't. There, I don't think there was anything Roman and Brock could have done to save this match. The fans just weren't going to care about it regardless. And the Drew McIntyre one, um, you could. I mean, you could kind of go either way. I mean, the show was very long, and you know Roman coming back from his uh, leukemia battle and everything, which was great to see him healthy and stuff. So. Um, you could kind of put that on either one. I, I I would say more towards his the WrestleMania show being very long. If this had been in the beginning, maybe WrestleMania, maybe it would have been a little bit differently. I don't know. Because like I said, Roman and Drew have good matches. So um, I just think this – I just think the WrestleMania overall itself was just so long. It was just like – it was just hard to care about a lot of things. Like once you got to that middle spot of the show, and that's where this match fell in line with. So Roman's going to take most of the backlash because he's the performer. But – yeah. Overall, to me, I think it has to go with a lot of booking. I think the way they booked the Big Dog's character throughout the years caused the fans to hate him even more than what they wanted because most people, I think, liked Roman Reigns. Like I said, it was just of how they were trying to perceive him. They didn't They didn't want him. The fans didn't want him to be what WWE wanted him to be. That was the issue. All right, so let's bottle all that sentiment to the end for the Big Dog. All right, well, Tribal Chief, man. He's him right now. This is the guy. This is the Tribal Chief is the one for sure. And he kicks off his WrestleMania resume at, as the Tribal Chief with an absolute classic, a low-key forgotten about main event at 37 against Edge and, Rit and Daniel Bryan for the Universal Championship. 22 minutes, 41 seconds. Meltzer, four and a half. Kitten, four and a half. Chad, four. Personally, I am four in three quarters. I think this is excellent. I thought that Brian and Edge brought it in Roman aura and suspense and everything leading up to it was awesome. And they hit an absolute home run of a match. Four and a half for me. Excellent main event. Um, especially the ending, establishing Roman as that dude now when he, he stacked both guys up and pinned them. I mean, that he was going to do it too. You got the picture right there. I mean, whew, man, that was. That was the Roman Reigns we've been waiting for. That's when I was like, oh, okay. Now, mm-hmm. th- th- now he's cooking with something. Yeah. 
now you're cooking with something. I mean, granted, this was three years ago, so mm-hmm. nobody, I mean, if you would have said three years ago, he would still be champion right now, and nobody would have fucking wild. <laughs> thought that shit would have been true. But the fact that he's still champion right now with the same reign is pretty crazy, man, to see how far he's come. So he has, he's had one of the greatest reinventions I've ever seen in my life. Like, mm-hmm. to go from being one of the most despised wrestlers on the roster to being one of the best on the roster and being fully accepted now by majority of the fans, man. All right. But 38 again, this is the, all right. So this is the last one I brought the boys to, right? And I was, I was, I was, I was there for this one. All right. So you can say, share the same sentiment. They go 12 minutes and 15 seconds. Yeah. This wasn't a good match either. Um, it's so you're not saying it's stupendous. <laughs> the biggest, I, I think, um, match. I think time. so. I was there for this match, and I was there for the last man standing match at SummerSlam too. Um, okay. The last man standing match should have been where WrestleMania was. That's the one. That should <laughs> yes. Ah, oh, you stole my heat, bro. Continue. That's where yeah. they. Um, that's what should have happened at WrestleMania because their last man standing match was great. You know, um, oh, that was great fun. It was a great match, but this match desperately needed a stipulation to it. Um, it, it just wasn't. It wasn't what it needed to be, man. Like to have Brock yeah. and Roman in the main event again when fans are like, "Oh no!" Like we don't, don't want to see that. <laughs> it again, was supposed man. to be day one. They fucked up Lashley. They fucked up Big E. They fucked up so many things leading into this. And now they're gonna combine these titles. No one wants to combine these titles. But to combine these titles, it's because to make Roman more special. It's to make more, put more of an exclamation point on Roman. And that's probably Paul Heyman's doing. I ain't a Paul Heyman hater. I love me some Paul Heyman. But the overemphasization of bullshit is kind of what Paul Heyman's uh, negative t- is. With If it's the F5s and 34 or making sure Roman gets two belts here is kind of the pivot of the down. Not want to say downfall, but, but a bad pivot in a way, too, of kind of the Roman Reigns run right here. I don't like combining the belts. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I'm not gonna put the blame on Paul Heyman. I don't know who came up with the idea. Probably yeah, Vince I think he's or, pushing shit. Uh, yeah. Probably Vince or somebody. Well, Vince has the ultimate decision, so he has the final say. Back then, he had the final say in everything. So um, he already knew he wanted Brock and Roman from the beginning, though. As soon as Brock came back to WWE, the first guy he went after was Roman. Granted, Roman and Brock now had an appealing story that made sense with Paul yes. Heyman being in the factor and Roman having a different character. Brock coming back as a different character, so it made things a lot intriguing, but. I think Vince already knew he wanted Brock and Roman in the main event. He 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 already knew ahead of time. You know what I mean? Like, it's the it's the reason why Brock won the title, and they combined it to make it even bigger. You know what I mean? I guess to try to make yeah. it more exciting than when it was. But um, I give it about a, a two and a half. For this match wasn't really all that spectacular. Yeah, Meltzer are th- uh, three and a quarter. Canton three and a half, a little high. Chad two and a half. I'm a I'm about a, a gentleman's three. And don't forget, mind you. What's Roman's shoulder popped out? They lost eight minutes in that match, so to speak. That was what they say anyway, so we'll see what they were building to. But it was the same style, bomb fest of whatever. And that brings us to last year. Mm-hmm. I adore this match. Uh, I can't say enough good things about this match. It's a four and a half across the board. I'm four fun. and a half plus. I'm four and three quarters. Uh, maybe, perhaps. We'll see what we get this year. But I absolutely, I thought this was a well-worked WrestleMania main event. The finish was wonky, of course, but it's what they had to do to get to WrestleMania 40. What's your thought on Cody Rhodes at WrestleMania 39? Easily five stars. Uh, this is Roman Reigns' best WrestleMania match by far to me. It's a top five WrestleMania match I've is, ever seen. Yes, it's so, the best match we've ranked, we have here ranked at a four and a half star uh, average. Um, yeah. I would say the the 31 and 39 match are his two best matches, but out of those two, the one with Cody was the better match for sure. Uh, it's a top five WrestleMania main event to me that I've seen. I think this year's going to be better, but um, Ooh, great high. grow. No, I don't think so. I think it's going to to be bigger. Just for I mean, if, especially if Cody wins, it's going to be even way bigger. I mean, last year, yeah. going to the match last year, I think there were a lot of fans neutral in the middle as far as who they wanted to win. There were still people who were very much behind Roman continuing to be champion. There as was also, I. <laughs> there were also people who wanted Cody to get that moment. Yep. Cody losing, I don't think was a bad choice because they continue to build him up and he continued to get even more popular than he, what he was last year. Then he wins another Royal Rumble. Now we're at, we're at the rocks involved now. So Cody winning this year, honestly, 
is going to be a bigger moment than what it had been last year because of the long-term story they've been doing to build this guy up, you know, with the ranking. Plus, except the Rock has come back to be a part of it and stuff. So um, I think this year is going to be better just as far as assuming they execute the right ending. You know, they make sure yeah. that you got the proper ending because this year I don't think I don't think Cody can afford the loss this year. Last year wasn't too bad, but if he loses to Roman again, I, I, don't, I don't know what that even means for Cody. I don't see how much further you can stretch out that feud then you've already stretched it like it's it's gone yeah. this distance um but last year's main event was really really good it's one of the most unpredictable matches that i've been a part that, of because i honestly did not know what was going to happen um yes uh, un unpredictable is a great 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 word for it you think it was the right call in hindsight for cody to lose yeah yeah it was fine i agree i mean cody, like i said cody losing was fine he's been built up even bigger Roman's still been champion. He's been doing great stuff, especially now. And I think there are more people now who, who who want him to lose this year than they did last year. I think that was the yeah. goal. I think there were still people last year who were still kind of behind Roman. There are still people behind him now, but I think it's more or less. I think there are people who now are just ready for it to be over. Like, it's got to be done with. And to have, to have Cody be in that spot again after the fans had demanded it when The Rock had come back and the fans were like, no, we don't, we can't do that. Like, you need to have Cody and Roman. That's the match we've been waiting for let Cody get that moment. I think that shows of how much the fans really care about this guy right now. So um, last year's main event, though, was, was really, really good. Uh, great storytelling, great unpredictability, great match yep. overall, great atmosphere, the crowd really being into it. And just overall not really knowing what was going to happen was the most exciting part because majority of matches, you kind of really know kind of the outcome. Sometimes mm -hmm. you can be a little bit surprised, but this one, I, I didn't know what was going to happen. Yeah, and, it, and it, there was massive stakes, and not knowing with massive stakes on the line is pretty, pretty cool. Uh, so final prediction, is this the year to, for Tody to uh, beat Roman? Yes, it has to be. Eh, I I agree. I don't know if I want it, but I, it, it has to be. Like you said earlier, what is Cody if he doesn't win? Um, This is Cody's time. They've been building him up to be the next guy. He's getting He the feels like reaction. it, too. He gets the proper reactions. He's got the fan support. He's that baby face WWE's really been looking for it to be that next good guy type guy. Um, it's got to be Cody this year. I mean, if it's not going to happen this year, you might as well just have Roman take it to the grave because he ain't losing at that point. And like, I don't want to see Cody Rose battle another year to get to Roman Reigns after what they did last year. It's just, they've done enough with it. They built him up. He's won another Royal Rumble, which hadn't happened back to back since Stone Cold did it. 97, so, 98. Yeah. They've done something that's never been done in the last two decades. They've added another big member of the of the family, a part of it, who seemed like he was going to steal his spot. Then they reversed it. They did an audible, which was great. Now The Rock's doing some of the best stuff I think he's done in some years as far as playing the heel character. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have Roman, because you can build up Rock and Roman for next year at WrestleMania. That can be built up for next year. I was playing cool. wherever, yeah. Um, it'll it'll be it'll happen at WrestleMania, but I, I, it, you can build it up a whole year like you did Rock yeah. and Cena. It, it could be fine, but I, it's it has to be Cody's moment. Sometimes in wrestling, you have to do the right thing and capitalize on the right moments, whether you like superstars or not. Cody Rhodes is the guy that majority of the fans have chosen. He deserves that moment. You got to give him that moment because if he doesn't win at WrestleMania, then there are people saying, well, you can drag it out further and you can do this. That's that's doing the most extra shit that doesn't need to be done. You don't need to drag it out even further. It's been, they've built it up for two years now. Two years is a long time. Like, I don't understand how people have this concept of you can push it further or it's it's too soon. It's been two fucking years. What are we talking about here? They built this guy up for two years with the same story they've been telling with them literally the night after he came back to WWE. That was the first yeah. promo he cut. So they've been building this guy up for two years to pretty much be the guy. If it's not going to happen this year, just don't even do it at this point. It's going down. I don't think. Say less. It's, not, it's going down. But Roman Reigns at WrestleMania, 10 total matches. For a 3.12 star rating average in those 10 matches, seven main events, six of them being world title matches, and three all time matches. But the all time matches are tip top tier, four and a half stars or above. That right there is why I have, or we have Roman Reigns at 10 on the WrestleMania Performers Countdown. 10 is because seven main events. And three of them are all-time matches. And but all-time matches like plus plus four and a half and up. Uh when he don't when he hits, he hits home runs at WrestleMania. Not to mention this year, but you got two of them this year. So mm -hmm. 
I think two. I think both. One of them will definitely year. hit. Yeah, I think both of them gonna be good. I think the Cody and Roman match itself will be better, but I think the tag match is gonna be great as well. I think it's gonna tell some great stories and have some some good moments in it. So I think he's gonna have you're gonna add more to that list. It's gonna be more good than bad. For sure. So, but Roman at ten, does it feel right? A little high, a little low. What do you think? Yeah, I, I still got to think about. I don't know if I have Roman in ten. I got I got to think overall about superstars' performances at WrestleMania. I mean, he's got the all-time main event, so that that counts for something. If he has two classics this year at WrestleMania back to back, then I would be like, all right, you know, I think he would make might be a little higher then. Yeah, yeah, I think he make a strong argument because then he would have the Brock match at thirty-one the triple threat match with Daniel and Brian and, and Edge and then two great matches with Cody plus the tag match that's five good matches right there so and now to me would weigh out more if we're talking strictly just main events by the way that weighs out more than a Triple H Taker and Lesnar you know what I'm saying as far as in the two Lesnar matches so that that weighs out a little bit more because like you said when he when he has the good matches they're really really good there's mm-hmm. only really one one shitty one on here, and that's the Lesnar at 34. The other ones were, excuse me, some of the other ones were bad, but um, I don't necessarily think that all those were necessarily his fault to, to be blamed for. Uh, but when he does really good, I mean, he's got some really, really classics. For sure. All right, well, that's it. I'm going to send you the spreadsheet, and you're going to have to get back to us in the comments and let us know if he's 10 or not by the time this comes out. All right? <laughs> I got you. I got you. All right, where can we catch you, Malik? Uh, Narcolepsy Boy 94, all social media platforms, YouTube, uh, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, or X as they call it now. Um, all social media platforms, same Narcolepsy Boy 94. Make sure you guys check me out if you enjoy wrestling content. For sure. I uh, I double stamped that. Thank you. See you soon, buddy. Thanks. All right, No So Nation. Thank you for joining us for number nine of the top 40 best wrestlemania performers countdown and i am here with a legend ryan gray and we're going over charlotte flair the queen not only just in wwe but the queen of wrestlemania ryan how do you feel about charlotte being number nine richie thank you for having me buddy i've always wanted to do one of these (laughs) and i'm glad to be doing one with you buddy oh charlotte at number nine i think it's warranted perhaps a little high in my opinion, a little bit, but she is definitely in the neighborhood of number nine. I think she's the most decorated woman in WrestleMania history, of course. I think she 100% deserved to be in the main event of WrestleMania 35. So her at nine, the best woman in WrestleMania history, I'm for it. Yeah, And she has a bunch of accolades in this WrestleMania, um, just stratosphere. You know, and she, every match that she's been in at WrestleMania has been for a championship which just shows to show that Charlotte is a prize fighter when it comes mm-hmm. to WrestleMania and women's division dominance. And let's go to her first WrestleMania, her WrestleMania debut in WrestleMania 32 versus Becky Lynch and Sasha Banks. And this is pre-man Becky Lynch. This is where Sasha Banks was still in her boss era. And <laughs> this match arguably stole the show over WrestleMania 32, which is a lackluster WrestleMania, but this is one of the high points of this match uh, of uh, Batmania. Would you agree? Yes, for sure, Richie. I would put this on night two, referring to our podcast that I did with you, retold and relived with Richie Mars. We broke down WrestleMania 32 and 35 and made them two separate nights. But anyways, <laughs> cheap plug, McFoley <laughs> style right there. But uh, yeah, Richie, they absolutely stole the show. This is the most memorable match next to probably Zack Ryder on a bloated WrestleMania. And uh, it was warranted. It's definitely a transition to the new era of women as they graduated the Diva title, threw that thing in the dumpster, and reestablished the WWE Women's World Championship. And, uh, you know, it was done really well with with Leader in the pre-show. And it was a great presentation and an overall very good match between the three women. Now, do you think Charlotte was the right call to be the inaugural at the time WWE Women's Championship? For sure. Mm-hmm. I think that she is uh cause she's kind of let's just put it as she's like the John Cena of the women's division in a way. Mm-hmm. You know, what I mean right. a lot of things a lot of things ricochet off her. She's a lot of person's best opponent. She should be the placeholder. You know, she has her flaws, of course, but uh I think to, to establish the women's revolution, especially to do to add in the legacy of her last name, and she's even above it at times, really. She she outshines 
uh, the, the legacy of her last name, I think. I think she uh, kind of outkicks her coverage. She was born on third base, but she hit a triple. Let's just put it that way. I know a lot of people at this time, myself included, thought Sasha Banks would be a better fit to be the inaugural women's championship because she was on fire at the, at this point. But as we would see from present day, probably long term, it was best that Charlotte was going to be the WWE women's champion, the first WWE women's champion. And speaking of that, it would then goes to the Raw women's championship once the brand split occurs. And we probably have... Probably Charlotte's most forgettable WrestleMania match, in my opinion. And that's WrestleMania 33, where Bailey's defending the Raw Women's Championship in an elimination match against Charlotte, Nia Jax, and Sasha Banks. We were so close for having the uh, horse women fatal four way, but Nia Jax is in there in place of Becky Lynch. This was a pretty interesting build if i were to say the least you know it's almost like wrestlemania 33 was the epitome of let's get everybody on the card just so we can yeah. say we got everyone on the card what were your thoughts on this fatal four-way match and do you think the more people that you involve in a championship match such as this it kind of dwindles the intrigue a little bit rather than a one-on-one -on -one match yeah uh, at least they made it an elimination match uh that kind of helped it a little bit i i think but it was like these girls were presented as stars mm -hmm. in the entrance and then you kind of forget the match and then even charlotte closing it with bailey real rather forgettable and did the win really help bailey in the wrong long run it was maybe mm -hmm. it gave her gave her an add a girl and an establishment but it's just a very forgettable Madams three match. Like it's not bad. It's 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 good enough. Just didn't have the aura and the legacy of the previous year. Yeah, which is very unfortunate because you have all this talent involved, and it's not as memorable as it should be with the talent that we have here. And we're still kind of getting their footing and still being established at that point in time. But speaking of being established in this point in time. WrestleMania 34, Charlotte Flair is the SmackDown Women's Champion going on a tear on the SmackDown brand, but there's somebody who's going on a similar tear, and that is the first female Royal Rumble winner, Asuka, who is undefeated at this point. Ryan, I'm going to give you the million-dollar question right here. Was Charlotte the right person to end Asuka's undefeated streak? Fortunately for Asuka... She wasn't ready for Charlotte, as she as she told us after the match. Yeah, uh, it's of course it's controversial, but kind of to the thirty two's point, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Charlotte's the placeholder. Mm -hmm. Charlotte is the queen. She's the establishment within the women's division. She's the measuring stick, so to speak. Unfortunately, Asuka has had peaks and valleys in her career, but she kind of peaked here as the streak kind of came to a close. The streak was kind of. I don't want to say an empty streak, but it was kind of like, what? what is she after this? You know what I mean? She didn't really find her footing for a while, perhaps till the pandemic after this. So I don't know. And Charlotte, what did it really do for her? She dropped the belt to the Iconics the next night or the next SmackDown. And then she was kind of on chase mode, got it back. And then she was picked again at SummerSlam over Becky. But then perhaps that gave Becky some juice. So yeah, maybe Charlotte must pose in a way added to the equity here that maybe helped Becky later that year, so to speak. So was it the right person? I don't think you can go wrong in, in the long of it. I don't think you can go wrong, but I wasn't like baffled by it whatsoever. I think I thought it was a great match. Yeah, and this is one of the only matches uh, apart from the last one that we'll get to that Charlotte is the baby face in this match to uh, a lesser extent uh, her and Asuka both came into the show as baby faces and then you kind of have that passing of the torch moment with Asuka and Charlotte how did you like Charlotte as a baby face champion do you think it's kind of like a miscast like a Randy Orton baby face champion or do you think she pulled it off well at this point of her career I think Charlotte stands are a thing like you think of Sasha stands and they ride or die with her right so I think that Charlotte is naturally hated and when she ha and then she has her ride or dies. Like I'm a ride or die with Charlotte. I'm not gonna stand mm -hmm. on a mountain and scream for Charlotte. But I know, however Charlotte is presented, I appreciate and tend to like her, especially in ring. Right? I definitely think these four horsewomen have like their stands, mm -hmm. and I don't really think that babyface or heel necessarily matters within them. And I think that's a part of the revolution. 
in a way too, where they are who they are. They're above left or right. They are the establishment within the women's division and Charlotte is at the top of that. So her as a baby face, of course, it's kind of like you're wearing a left shoe on your right foot in a way, but I still think you can walk a little bit with it. Yeah, we're definitely in a shades of gray type of era. And during that time in the women's uh, revolution, a lot of shades of gray were coming down. And speaking of shades of gray, nothing was more shades of gray than the man Becky Lynch herself, who you alluded to earlier that she was on a complete tear after WrestleMania 34, turning on Charlotte at SummerSlam, where the crowd rejoiced because they thought Charlotte was not in that position. WWE SmackDown head writer Road Dog said at the time that the fans were kind of the blame for this story not really working out for Becky and Becky's heel turn. But Becky was just so likable and so uh, on fire at that point that the crowd support was behind her. And we eventually got Becky and Ronda. But wait a minute. Something airs its its head. And that is Charlotte Flair being added to the match at the bequest of the McMahons. So, and Charlotte went on Stone Cold Steve Austin's uh, Broken Skull Sessions, where she would have liked to be a little bit more involved in the authority, be more of like more backstage segments with them, more kissing up to the authority, basically being the dreaded heel that we all wanted to see. Did you think that would be a little bit of a better approach as opposed to how they kind of shoehorned in this match because it was the perceived main event at the time? Yeah, I, I thought that would have fit pretty well, her and that persona. She has like Stephanie McMahon traits in a way, so I definitely, <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. I can definitely see that fitting. I, I wasn't aware of that, that she said that, or I, I didn't recall. I don't recall it anyways. I'm sure I watched The Broken Skull, but it didn't retain it. Uh, that's interesting for sure. I think that it would have definitely worked. And what she beat Asuka again a year later to win the type of title on like a random SmackDown. And then Vince came out and was like, you're in the, you're in the <laughs> WrestleMania main event. Pretty much. That's what it was. And it's like, winner takes all this match needs to be bigger than bigger. You know what I mean? So it's just like, mm -hmm. yeah, of, of course, having her flirting with the authority, her being the female Randy Orton in the authority a la 2013, 2014 would have fit like an absolute glove. Now let's talk about the adage of that SmackDown women's championship. Was it necessary? Or do you think it was kind of like Charlotte and just kind of like tacked on to a already heated storyline? Well, it seems like behind the stage and on screen that Charlotte was kind of promised this main event mm -hmm. and back to 32 where Charlotte is the establishment. So how are you going to have a women's revolution come to a full hall and made a, a WrestleMania without the establishment and without Charlotte Flair? So in a way, I can't see it without her. I think it's deserved, warranted. I think she's earned it. But on a storyline in a fan's point of view, no, it was Becky. <laughs> Becky earned it. Becky stole it. Becky was the man. No pun intended. It, she... Totally leapfrogged a bunch of women, got to the front of the line, and it should have been her. Then it's Ronda Rousey, like from a marquee standpoint. Could it have been without Ronda? I guess not. Probably not, right? Mm -hmm. But I, what I will say is Charlotte was that best wrestler that night. Charlotte was the glue of that match, keeping it like I gave it three and a quarter stars, mm -hmm. and I was the highest out of the three on that. It's 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 a pretty good match, but it doesn't live up to the aura in the presentation of a women's WrestleMania main event for the first time. But all that being said, Charlotte made that thing flow. Charlotte was stiff. Charlotte was on her game that night and kept that thing together and was the brightest bulb in that match. And she shined. I loved her entrance and in ring. She brought it. Becky seemed like a step off. Perhaps the stage was a little big and little nerves or whatever. Maybe we can get to that in her book when we get to it in her book, Richie. Mm -hmm. And Rhonda was had her foot out the door and she broke her wrist, what, three minutes into the match. So there was a lot of working parts against that match once the bell rang. But Charlotte was fantastic in that match. Mm -hmm. Now you say Charlotte is the establishment pretty much of the woman's uh, revolution, the woman's evolution. Do you yep. think being the perceived establishment hinders her character growth? Look at the uh, stipulation or titles, right? <laughs> The title is her gimmick, unfortunately. Charlotte is, is not the best promo in the world. Her character 
is what it is. It's I don't want to say it's a bad character, but sometimes it lacks connection. So yeah, there's definitely some flaws there, but she can go, man. And mm -hmm. the revolution was an in-ring point of view and a perception point of view. And she lives up to the perception, even though I kind of highlighted some of her, I don't want to say flaws, because I, th I still think she's very good in the role. And I, I still think there's, it's her and Becky are in a tier above the other two horsewomen. And perhaps Rhea and Bianca are entering that tier. Maybe Bailey will get there too. And who knows about Sasha one day. But I still, to my heart of hearts, I always felt that Becky and Charlotte were in that a tier above all the women, right? And mm -hmm. so it, it's kind of hard yeah. for me to say she hasn't earned it or what or whatnot. What about you, Rich? Uh, I definitely do think Charlotte is in that A S tier of WWE since they let, let's call it like what it is when they brought up Charlotte, Becky, and Sasha, a soft reboot of the women's division of adding these new faces faces who can actually go and pretty much trailblazing the new style of what WWE woman would then be known for and so i do think charlotte's in there for her in ring work and her presence alone which is not easy to obtain i think becky's in there just for her presence alone she's not the best in ring worker from a technical ability but her presence her moves you can name every becky lynch move that she does and it works for her and there's a reason why she's been the perceived uh, face of WWE for the women for such a long time. And I think it's just because she's likable, she's rootable. And I do think Charlotte is kind of on the opposite end when it comes to uh, likability. Because if you were to create a picture-perfect superstar, Charlotte would be one of the templates that you would choose. You know, wins everything, wins all the championships. And unfortunately, not a lot of people can get behind somebody who wins all the time you know because that's just an unrealistic portrayal of what people are while well, becky is more realistic yep. so i think for the idea of when you think of the word superstar charlotte fits that mold but who connects with the people more it would be becky lynch but both of them are so good at their pre like again they establish their presence that both of them i agree are in that s tier above with you know, some people creeping up on it. I know Rhea's creeping up on it and Bianca. I think Rhea's creeping up on it more so than Bianca currently. But again, oh, yeah. it's dead even when it comes to both of them. And I think Bailey is somewhere in the middle of S and A. Yeah, big year for Bailey. Maybe, mm -hmm. hopefully, we've, you know, on a list like this, she would maybe make it in the future, perhaps. But I think the, she's in a transition and it could be a transition for the better. Mm hmm. And uh, speaking of uh, tra not a transition for the better, but a transition and disconnect in some regards of WrestleMania 36, we have Rhea Ripley versus Charlotte Flair for the NXT Women's Championship. Yep. And of course, this was the empty performance center, WrestleMania. Now, Ryan, do you think the NXT Championship being on the line in this WrestleMania with Charlotte winning the Royal Rumble and choosing Rhea Ripley because Rhea Ripley golded into her, do you think the reason why Charlotte chose the NXT championship was because of the AEW factor. All right. So this is January, 2020 AEW's hot a NXT is hanging around. Mm -hmm. uh, so what you thought that putting Charlotte on TV would kind of solidify that Wednesday night war into the WWE favor and presenting a WrestleMania program on that stage would rather help. Is that what you're trying to say? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that has something to do with it. And I also have something to do that it, Charlotte didn't have much going on. It was for sure Bailey and Sasha's time to do their thing. And they found themselves in a multi-women's match. And it was still Becky Lynch season. So I think that there wasn't necessarily a fresh matchup for Charlotte. And there was a very good compromise with a need on Wednesday nights. So let's kind of put all that into a bowl and make a decent recipe. And in my humble opinion, Richie, I stand by that four and a quarter rating in an empty performance center with all the negatives going it against it. it. This just proved how good Charlotte is and how good of a storyteller she is in this ring and how physical she is. And of course, you need two to hango and Rhea brought it, a very younger Rhea brought it, who was ready for this stage. But God damn, was this structure tight and good. The chops, the trash talk, the woos, the grunts of the submissions, the work. I stand by this all-time match at four and a quarter. And, of course, 
Meltzer didn't rate this because, you know, he didn't want to rate any of the performance center matches. But would you say this was the best performance center match that we've had during that pandemic era? Uh, For that night, 100 percent. Yes. Yeah. And let's fast forward a little bit now. Originally, it was going to be Asuka versus Charlotte versus Rhea at WrestleMania 37, but Charlotte Flair got pulled, and then we got Rhea versus Asuka with Rhea Ripley winning the Women's Championship. So now we have to skip to the next year in the WrestleMania main event that a lot of people thought it was going to be at WrestleMania 35, but we waited till WrestleMania 38 to have Charlotte Flair defend against Rowdy Ronda Rousey, that Royal Rumble winner in the semi-main event of that night's WrestleMania. Do you think the bloom was off the rose with Ronda Rousey versus Charlotte Flair at this point? Yeah. And uh, I think, again, Charlotte went out there and had a great performance with a semi-checked in. I won't say semi-checked out, but I'll say a semi-checked in Ronda Rousey, who perhaps thought she perhaps should have made a vented over Stone Cold and had a little boo-boo face. You know, that infamous Sasha Banks boo-boo face in her entrance when things aren't going her way. You saw that in Ronda Rousey this night. But... To her credit, she dropped it, and they went out there and had a really, really good match in a hard spot. This was coming off two matches earlier, Bianca Belair versus Becky Lynch. One match previous, Cody Rhodes returns against Seth Rollins. The cr- I was in the crowd. We were fucking gassed and exhausted, and the last thing we wanted to see was a Ronda Rousey match. But to Charlotte's credit, very similar to two years previous against Rhea. She was stiff. She brought it, and just unfortunately... The crowd was a little more lively at 36 than they were at 38 for this match. <laughs> and what did you think of the ending? Because I know the ending was very controversial. The first uh, one-on-one pinfall loss of Rowdy Ronda Rousey's career. Do you think it was pulled off pretty well? Or do you think it was kind of like a going through the motions kind of finish? Listen to this. It, parallel, 32, first ever, you know, well, let's kick off the revolution. She wins. It's, she beats Asuka in a high point. She beats Rhea at a high point. I wasn't, uh, of course, Charlotte must pose. And she didn't take the pinfall at 35, and she was the last one standing at 33 before Bailey went over. But Charlotte's book strong. So, mm-hmm. yeah, it was, uh, in, of course, Rhonda, you went away for two years. You talked some shit. You were, a har- you, you know, you were a hard bargain to get back. You played a lot of games with us. Eat a little shit. Charlotte, you're a company woman. Here's your prize. Mm-hmm. I-, I was more so uh, talking about, like, how that match finish was yeah i believe the chair was involved and it just kind of looked a little wanky the rough bump and it just didn't seem like a wrestlemania-esque finish it just kind of came off a little bit odd i believe yeah it was yeah well 35 ronda's pinfall was a little a little weird too right so maybe perhaps to my earlier point with the boo-boo face but I, but I will say it was to get us to the next match in in Providence where they in backlash wrestle backlash of WrestleMania. We, they had that pretty good you know street brawl submission match which was pretty good. So yeah, it was a weird finish, wonky finish, but it kind of had a purpose to get us to the next month and to give continue Charlotte with her strong resume here from a kayfabe aspect aspect too. And let's finish that strong resume with possibly the strongest match Charlotte's ever had at. WrestleMania. If she was an artist, this would be her Mona Lisa, her Picasso painting. It's the rematch from the empty performance center match at WrestleMania 36. It is Charlotte Flair versus Rhea Ripley. This is personally my match of the year for 2023. The IC championship match being very close behind it. So Ryan, tell me about this match. How'd you like it? Listen, four and three quarters, almost virtually perfect. A fantastic match. All these attributes I talk about, Charlotte bringing it. If it's with Asuka in a technical brawling aspect before, if it's with Rhea with a kick-ass motherfucking, let's bring it in the liver at 36. This had beautiful callbacks to 36. They had the fans. They were hungry. But do you believe the sentiment that Ronda Rousey spewed out this week that Charlotte threw her big dick on the table and said, no, we are going out there to have a real WrestleMania match where it was supposed to be uh, an abbreviated version of this. Do you believe that? Or is it just kind of Ronda just talking to the clouds? I do remember reports at this time saying that the Charlotte and Rhea match went long, but then people didn't really mind it. And I wouldn't mind it either because what look at the end result that we got. So again, it's like that old saying, uh, 
uh, the truth is somewhere in the middle where it's like one story, the other story, and then you have the almighty truth in the middle. <laughs> so I think an aspect of that is correct. But again, we need to find out what all parties involved say about it. So I think it's uh, one of those deals where Charlotte, like you said, she's that cornerstone. I think she could do what she wants. And if she wants to have a longer match, she'll get a longer match. And look, it didn't even hamper the main event. So again, this is probably as perfect of a championship match as you're going to get out of WrestleMania in general. But now let's segue to Charlotte's WrestleMania matches. And we have all of them right here on the screen about all the match ratings. You got your match ratings on here. And we also have all the community match ratings as well. And coming in at number four, it's Charlotte versus Rhea Ripley at WrestleMania 36. Then we have at number three, we have Charlotte's WrestleMania debut against Becky Lynch and Sasha Banks. And then at number two, we have versus Asuka at WrestleMania 34. And then at number one, the match we just discussed, Charlotte versus Rhea Ripley for the SmackDown Women's Championship at WrestleMania 39. Do you think this is an apropos list or ranking of Charlotte's matches, or is there anything that you would switch around? 36, I'd probably be a little higher on than most. It's, I think her, I think it's her second best match, but being in the empty, empty performance center and Meltzer not really rating it probably hurt it. Yeah, I was there for Asuka. I thought it was fantastic. It's probably her second match. The third one at 32 is so historical. And uh, yeah, it, she has an all-time resume. Nothing on this list is bad at all. And if that Ronda's match, your worst match, I gave it three and a half, which is, which is very good. I just, they were just in a bad spot following those two classic matches before it but if once you know if you watch it in a vacuum it's a very good match it that's with a rusty pouty ronda rousey so charlotte's the queen man charlotte's awesome which one is your favorite on this list 30 last 39 39 is probably my favorite i've always had a soft spot for 34 as well i i usually go back and forth between the two because uh arguably those stole the show at wrestlemania at their yeah. respective WrestleManias. And to say that Charlotte arguably had uh, three, even four matches that you could consider uh, that stole the show at WrestleMania. Again, for her, her uh, amount of WrestleManias that she has, she has, uh, I believe, seven right over here. And yeah. having four out of the seven being show stealers, that's a pretty good record. Yeah. And the, and the other three, none of them are misses. They're just mm -hmm. good. Yeah. So, you know, so it's just like the queen has standards and I think she's met every one of them. She don't right. miss. Yeah, she don't miss. She ain't mellow, but she don't miss. Well, Ryan, <laughs> thank you for joining me on this. No, so countdown number nine, best WrestleMania performer, Charlotte Flair, top 40. We still got eight to go and I can't wait to see who clears out the top eight. But Ryan, thank you so much for having me on here. And of course, you can catch me, Richie Mars, at Retold Richie Mars on the Instagram and the TikTok. And Re Wrestling Retold and Relive with Richie Mars every Tuesday on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Ryan's on a great episode of where we discuss making WrestleMania's 32 through 35 Night, night one and night two WrestleManias. See where Charlotte's matches go on which nights of our respective lists. But anyway, TTFN, Tata for now, and we'll see you at number eight.